A blessed evening to everyone. Today we will start a new series entitled Peculiar When God Qualifies the Unqualified. He talks about how God responds to the kind of characteristics that human beings are displaying in relation to his ministry and work. And we have an amazing God who finds individuals, though we are not qualified to become part of his kingdom and the work of his kingdom, he qualifies even those who are not qualified as long as the person is willing. We will be looking at Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 22 for the meditation this evening. And it is entitled, When God Called an Antagonist. One of the kinds of people that I don't like to be with is somebody who is antagonistic in his way of dealings. And usually, an antagonist, usually, not all the time, but usually a person who is antagonistic is often pessimistic as well in his lookout in life. And I think it's not only me, many of us, but this kind of reality and experience is not only experienced by human beings like you and me. God himself experiences antagonism. One time, my classmate from Bangladesh chatted with me, sent me a message asking that I would include them in my prayers. And I asked him, what's your situation now? And he said, the people here in my country are hostile as far as the gospel is concerned. They would hate you. They will not only dislike you when you preach the gospel to them, but they will hate you. And he said, these are the kinds of individuals that we are dealing with. And so I included him in my prayers. Two weeks later, he sent to me another message. He said, please pray for us more and more because there are more people in our country who are harassing us. Before, they were harassing us with words, but this time with actions. They were in fact threatening us. So I continued praying for this guy and his family. A week later, he sent to me an image. In that image, there was a lifeless old man lying on the ground. And I asked him, what is this? He said, that is my father-in-law, shot to death by an extremist because we were preaching the gospel in one of the villages in our place. These people who were against the work of God's kingdom were antagonistic as far as the preaching of the gospel is concerned. Not only human beings would experience antagonism, but even God himself. However, when we look at our reactions, when we face people who are having this kind of characteristics, the common response that we give is that either we avoid them, or we shoo them away, or we quarrel with them. That's a common response that human beings would display to someone who is antagonistic in his kind of behavior. But is it also the same reaction or response that God would give to anyone who is antagonizing his work? Not really. Let's look at the experience of the Apostle Paul who's called Saul in the text that we will read, because this guy was an antagonist to the work and ministry of the believers. Let's open our Bibles in the book of Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22, and we'll be reading only verses 1 to 9. Acts 9, 1 to 22, for the discussion, we will be dealing with the entire section, but for the scripture reading, we would only read from verse 1 up to verse 9. It says here, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus, 
So that if he found any belonging to the way, take note, the words the way, that's how the early people called the Christians. They were not called Christians, they were called the way. Probably it came from the statement of Jesus when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a probability. They were called the way. Both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you that what you must do. The man who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. Saul, or known to be Paul later in the New Testament writings. This guy's name was Saul, and that name had a wonderful meaning. The word Saul actually meant a great man. This guy was considered a great man by the society in those days for many reasons. But one of the main reasons was that he was a highly educated person and he's a part of the Pharisees, the Pharisaic group. An individual or a group of people in the society back then in the New Testament times that the people looked up to, they were like lawyers who were experts not only as far as the law is concerned, but as well with the commandments of God. So these were individuals that were highly looked up to in the society. Now what happened here was that Saul was looked up to because of his educational attainment. He was like a graduate of a prestigious university. While the New Testament writings doesn't mention any kind of university, but there were individuals in their time that were considered an institution just by themselves. And one of those individuals that was really considered to be an institution as a person himself was Gamaliel. In the New Testament, Gamaliel was considered to be a highly respected person as far as his wisdom is concerned. So if one student sits at the feet of Gamaliel and learns from him, that student is considered to be like studying in a prestigious university. Paul sat under the feet of Gamaliel. And he was considered to be a highly intellectual person who received wisdom from an institution whose name was Gamaliel. Now, this guy, who was highly intellectual, was going against the way. The believers, the followers of Jesus, the persecution of the early church was recorded in the book of Acts. This book does not only record the acts of the Holy Ghost. It does not only record the works of the disciples of Jesus, but it also records the persecutions that the believers went through. And that persecution was initiated by, in the earlier part, the religious leaders of Israel. But when you reach chapter 7, it was no longer the religious leaders. The number one antagonist back then was Saul himself. Saul was mentioned in chapter 7 when the people around stoned Stephen to death. This guy was described as giving permission as well, agreeing with the death sentence that these people gave upon Stephen. For what reason? For preaching the gospel. So these religious leaders were antagonistic as far as the work of Jesus Christ. 
What happened next from chapter 7 onwards? You would see Saul leading all the persecutions that happened to the believers. And he did not only lead, lead the persecution inside Jerusalem. The believers were scattered all over Judea and Samaria and Saul did not stop in Jerusalem. When the believers went out of the city, he started chasing, running after them. And he was not contented of just running after them. He sought for a, a paper, a letter, an authorization from the highest authority of the religious leaders that he could bring this authorization so that he can seize, he can catch, he can harass the believers that were gathering in the different synagogues, even in Damascus. So this guy was a legit antagonist toward Jesus and his people. One day, Saul was on his way to Damascus, bringing the authorization of the religious leaders. He was so determined to destroy this new sect that came after the resurrection of Christ. He wanted to put in behind bars the believers. He wanted them to be killed. And while he was walking, entering the city of Damascus, something happened. Saul encountered a light that flashed from heaven. And then when he saw the light, it blinded him. He fell to the ground. And then after seeing this light that blinded him, he heard a voice that says, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul responded with a question saying, Who are you, Lord? Did he know that it was Jesus? No. They did not call, he did not call Jesus Lord when Jesus wasn't crucified yet, even after resurrection. Saul did not perceive Jesus that way. But he said, Lord, because he recognized that this was an extraordinary being. So he said, Lord, because he did not know who this person is and because there is power accompanying the incident, he said, who are you, Lord? Surprisingly, the voice answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus. Wait a minute. Sino ba yung pini-persecute ni Saul? He was persecuting the believers. Why did Jesus tell him that I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting? That conveys the idea of a unified identity that believers have with Jesus. That is why whatever Saul did to the believers, because they were identified, unified with the resurrected Savior, whatever Saul did to them, he did to Christ as well. The church, the believers, the followers of Christ, they received the persecution. And once the persecutor realized that these people belong to an extraordinary being, then there was something that happened in his life as well, in his inner being. So after that incident, while Saul saw and heard everything, the Bible tells us that his companions did not see the light, but they heard the voice. I think God did not allow them to see the light so that they will not be blinded, so that they will be able to guide Saul toward the city of Damascus. But they were allowed to hear so that they could become testifiers of the incidents. And so they led Saul to Damascus. Meanwhile, while these things happened, Jesus appeared to another person, this time not to an antagonist, but part of the protagonist, part of the believers, the body of Christ. And the name of this guy was Ananias. And Jesus told Ananias, Ananias, I want you to go to this street and on that particular unit, you knock on the door and I would like you to meet a man named Saul. You know what Ananias said to the Lord? Lord, no. Are you kidding me? 
Why? Because Ananias knew Saul. Not only the believers, but even the non-believing community, they knew this guy. He was a popular person in Jerusalem. And he was known for all the persecutions that he did before the Christians. So when Ananias heard the order of Jesus to go to Saul, I don't like. But Jesus said to him, don't worry about it. Because I have chosen this man to bear my name, to testify about what happened to me, to bear witness to my crucifixion and my resurrection before the Gentiles, before the kings, and even before the sons of Israel. And so, walang nagawa si Ananias. He left and went where Saul was. When he arrived there, he related to Saul what Jesus told him. And as he ministered to him, there was a scale-like object that fell from the eyes of Saul. It was then when he began seeing again. And what happened next was a surprise. Because if you look at the last part of the text, particularly in verses 19b to 22, we will see what happened to Saul. Let's read it. 19b to 22. Now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. Wait a minute. Why did he go to Damascus? Bringing the authorization letter from the highest religious authorities to persecute the Christians in the synagogues. But what happened to him in verse 20? He went to the synagogues to pray, to preach, and to proclaim about Jesus Christ. And in verse 22, But Saul kept increasing in his strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. There was a turnabout in the life of Saul. How in the world that the leading antagonist became the leading proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles, to the kings, and even to the sons of Israel. How in the world it happened? It happened because of one thing. This guy had an encounter with Jesus Christ. An encounter with the Lord would change, can change the person's life. The perspective, the heart, the mind was entirely changed. 180 degrees, he turned. And then now, from being an antagonist, from being an enemy of the gospel, he became someone who propagated the gospel, not only in Israel, but even in the world of the Gentile, outside the nations of Israel. This guy experienced that encounter and this incident does not only happen in the New Testament, it happens even in the 21st century. I would like to relate to you two stories. One is that there was an author. I read his writings, many of his books, not all, but many of his books. His name is Lee Strobel. I don't know if you are familiar with him. Lee Strobel is a journalist and at the same time a lawyer. I cannot imagine the brain with such combination in his arsenal. A journalist and at the same time a lawyer. This guy was an atheist. And he had a wife and his wife was an agnostic. Now, what are these terms? A person who believes in God is called theist. A person in the opposite side who does not believe in God is called atheist. Okay? So, a the, ang theist, the theist would say, there is God existing. The atheist would say, there is no God existing. The other one that I mentioned, would say, I don't know. That's an agnostic. 
I don't know if there is no God. I don't know if there is God. I don't know if I could know about it. That's an agnostic. Lee Strobel was an atheist who was also battling against believers who were claiming that there is God who exists. And alongside him was his agnostic wife. One time, after the years of being together, Lee Strobel noticed that something was happening in the life of his wife. He noticed that she was showing a lot of changes in her character. And so he started investigating. It's natural for him because he is a lawyer and at the same time a journalist. He's good at research. He's good at investigation. He's good at logic. So he investigated. He found out that those changes that his wife showed, characterized, were byproducts of the newfound faith of his wife. He found out that his wife was now a believer of Jesus Christ. So from an agnostic standpoint, she became a follower of Jesus. Not only a theist, not only being becoming theist, but becoming a Christian. When he found that out, he cannot just discard what he saw in the life of his wife. Lee Strobel said, because of the changes that happened to her, I cannot just brush it off. So I will make a research and further investigation for two things. He investigated two things. I mean, first is that he investigated about the existence of God. Second, he investigated about Jesus Christ and his claims. He did not go to the Bible in his investigation because the Bible assumes already the existence of God. The Bible assumes already the veracity of the claims of Christ. So he did not go to the Bible. He went to the extra-biblical resources. He interviewed historians. He asked questions toward archaeologists. He asked questions to other individuals who were into the field of science and asked many things. After years of research and investigation, he came up with a conclusion that there is a God existing. So the next research that he did was about Jesus and his claims. And he did that research again, investigating, asking questions, looking for answers. And he came up with a conclusion that Jesus truly is the God who came to this world in the form of a flesh and offers salvation to fallen humanity. This guy became a believer and he wrote many books. Few of his writings were The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for Grace, and many more. You can search for his name at, uh, on, in Google and I think the engine would also give you several of his writings. If you are into reading, I encourage you to read his writings because it would strengthen your faith in God and your faith in Christ. This man, who was once not a believer, who went against the teaching of Christianity, who went against God and his belief, was like an opposite of what God wants people to claim about. And yet, later in his life, he became a minister of the gospel, influencing and confounding with other people who don't believe in God. The change that Paul, that Saul experienced, did not only happen in the New Testament time. It happens even in the 21st century. Lee Strobel is living in America, but it does not only happen in America. It happens even in the Philippines. Few years ago, I worked with the national office as the national youth director. Alongside that particular job that I did was becoming part of disciples, the discipleship team that was created to help churches towards, shift towards discipleship churches. 
we visited one district, and in that particular district, there was one of the many churches, a small congregation. The pastor of the church was so fiery in terms of evangelism. So we went there, taught them about the material, taught them about the process, and he embraced it. He became even more and more, what is this, passionate about evangelism and discipleship. This guy leads his congregation every Sunday afternoon. So after the worship in the morning, they will go home for their lunch, and around 1 or 2 o'clock, they'll go back to the church, they will pray, and then go out to the community to preach to the community. While they were preaching many days, many times, many weeks, they experienced harassment from one person. This person was a notorious man in the community. He was a drunkard. One time, while they were preaching the gospel, this man came to them bringing a bolo. All of them were scared. But they were able to manage what they felt. The following week, they went out again to continue preaching. In one of the following weeks, they were there near a store sharing the gospel to an individual. It so happened that this man came, but this time he was not drunk. He went to the store not to listen to the preaching. He went to the store to buy beer or to buy. But when he was there, he heard the believers sharing the gospel to the person next to him. So he did not have any choice, but he also heard what was proclaimed to this person. And right at that moment, the Spirit of God touched his heart. And he became a believer. I don't know if he still bought the wine from the store after that moment. But this guy started following them Sunday after Sunday, listening to the preaching of the gospel. Time came that this guy was no longer contented of just listening to the preaching. He started moving around the community, proclaiming to the people around the gospel of Jesus. And many people became believers of Jesus because of him. Why? Because they could not believe. Before they look at his life, and the only conclusion that they had in mind is, This man is hopeless. And yet, when they saw the life of this man transformed, who was before a drunkard and is now proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, they could not believe the miracle of a changed life. And they started listening to him, and they started surrendering their lives to Jesus. A church was born through that man. Imagine, once an antagonist to the preaching of the word, going against God and his people. But Jesus is in the business of initiating an encounter with him. When a sinner encounters the grace and the love of Christ, a transformation can happen in the life of that man. Amazing work of an amazing God. Normally for human beings, when we encounter an antagonist, we shoo away the person, we avoid the person, we quarrel with the person, we debate against the person. But God's action is truly peculiar. Because even that person was a leading antagonist to him. He operates in love and grace and calls that person to be a testifier of his love, of his death, and of the life that he gives. This is not an isolated case, my brothers and sisters, because I believe many of us in the past were somehow antagonists to the gospel. But when Jesus initiated an encounter, you and I experienced the Lord. And now we are here worshiping Him. 
you have been changed. You experience the love of God. You experience the love of Jesus. And today, if there is someone in your life, in your family, in your circle of friends who is an antagonist to your faith and to your service to God, don't lose hope. Pray for that person before the Lord. Because at the end of the day, it's not us who changes lives. It's Jesus who changes lives. One of the days to come, that person who is an antagonist to the gospel, basig mas init pa na kontra sa pagpangalagad nimo sa ginoo. Because when one encounters the love and grace of the blessed Savior, changes are certainly would happen Changes would certainly happen in the life of that person. May we all continue upholding individuals who are going against God. And may we continue to be thankful and grateful before Him for how He allowed us to encounter Him and how He affected changes in our lives. He moved us from darkness to light, from being an enemy, and now He calls us His own, the children of God. With that, May we all treasure in our hearts and minds what Christ has given to all of us. God bless you all and good evening.